It is healthy to be reminded that the strongest might weaken and the wisest might err. These words from Mahatma Gandhi remind us to be cautious of idolizing figures we admire. No one person is purely good or evil. They exist on a sliding scale of morality that ebbs and flows throughout their lives. And nowhere is that concept more apparent than in the very person who said the quote. Today, we take a look at the dark side of Mahatma Gandhi. Born as Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi on October 2nd, 1869 in Porbandar, India, Gandhi was the youngest child of his father's fourth wife. His father, Karamchand Gandhi, was the chief minister or Dewan of Porbandar. His mother, Putlibai, was obsessed with religion and frequently fasted as well as splitting her time between the home and the temple. He grew up in a home observant of Vaishnavism, which is the worship of the Hindu god Vishnu. His home was also somewhat practicant of Jainism, an Indian religion with tenets of non-violence and believing that everything in the universe is eternal. Because of this, Gandhi practiced vegetarianism, ahizma, or non-injury of all living things, fasting for self-purification, and tolerance of all creeds and sects. He joined the Samaldas College after passing the examination at the University of Bombay in 1887. He attempted to improve his English and Latin language skills by taking the University of London matriculation exam, and in doing so, spent three years in England. He returned to India in July of 1891. His mother had died while Gandhi was abroad, and he had faced difficulty in the legal profession he had hoped to partake in. After some career struggles, in 1893, Gandhi was offered a year's contract from an Indian firm in Natal, South Africa. He stayed in South Africa for over 20 years, returning to India only briefly in 1896 to 1897. While in South Africa, Gandhi faced racial discrimination, including an instance where he was asked to remove his turban at a Durban court. He was also thrown out of a first-class train compartment and later beaten by a white stagecoach when he refused to leave his seat to make room for a European passenger. He and other non-Europeans were often banned from European-only hotels. In response to the experiences he faced regarding discrimination, Gandhi founded the Natal Indian Congress. In his role here as secretary, he inundated the government, legislator, and press with statements of grievances of the Indian people. He was also able to expose to the outside world the discrimination faced by the Indian subjects of Queen Victoria. Even the Times of London and the Statesman commented on these statements by the Natal Indian Congress. Gandhi was the dominant political figure of India by 1920. He led many nonviolent actions to the Indian National Congress, or the Congress Party. These included such actions as boycotts of British goods and British legislators, courts, offices, and schools. Famously, he led the Salt March in 1930, which was a protest against the British tax on salt. This was one of Gandhi's most successful campaigns. He led the Indian fight for independence beginning in 1942. He first demanded immediate British withdrawal from India, an action known as the Quit India Movement. He then struggled in aiding Muslim, Hindu, and British leaders negotiate Indian independence. One item he failed to achieve was blocking the Mountbatten Plan, which divided the subcontinent into a Hindu-majority India and a Muslim-majority East and West Pakistan. India eventually gained independence on August 15, 1947. Following this, many Muslim-Hindi riots broke out, which Gandhi worked to stop. Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated on January 30, 1948 by a Hindu radical displeased with Gandhi's effort to achieve peace between Muslims and Hindus. His legacy lasts as many still revere him as the father of the country. He is largely revered for his nonviolent practice of social justice, his religious acceptance, and ability to bring conflicting groups to harmony. To quote Gandhi again, it is healthy to be reminded that the strongest might weaken and the wisest might err. While Gandhi's work for peace and acceptance cannot be overlooked, in recent years, scholars have pointed out Gandhi's troubling and racist views of black Africans. South African academics Ashwin Desai and Ghulam Vahed published a book, The South African Gandhi, Stretcher Bearer of Empire, which details some of his problematic beliefs and actions. During his time in South Africa, he wrote about black people by repeatedly using a racial slur and believed Indians were infinitely superior to black people. He also wrote that white people were the predominating race. The scholars point out that Gandhi's work in South Africa was to fight for the rights of Indians living there, but he did not hold the same views on the black South Africans, despite them also being in a similar situation in terms of being discriminated against because of their race by British colonial powers. Gandhi, they state, appeared to be unmoved by the struggles of black people in South Africa. Gandhi believed that governmental power should remain in the hands of white people in the region. He also wanted racial segregation between Indians and black Africans, and some South Africans think that Gandhi actively worked with the British government to promote racial segregation. According to Desai and Vahed, Gandhi's belief in the superiority of white people and Indians over Africans, his exclusion of Africans from history, and his support of and role in minority white rule all lead to the conclusion that Gandhi was racist. But before we get into Gandhi's concerning relationship with sex and women, let's first dispel the popular rumor that Gandhi and Hitler were friends. 
Yes, he wrote to Hitler calling him friend, and signing both letters as your sincere friend. However, both letters were an attempt to persuade Hitler to avoid war. Also, Gandhi notes in his second letter that everyone is his friend, that I address you as a friend is no formality. I own no foes. My business in life has been for the past 33 years to enlist the friendship of the whole of humanity by befriending mankind, irrespective of race, color, or creed. So while this fact may seem alarming on the surface, it seems it was likely a tactic to sway Hitler using a more familiar tone. In fact, he calls his actions monstrous and unbecoming of human dignity in the second letter. At the age of 38, Gandhi took a vow of celibacy. He had already had four children with his wife Kasturba, who he married when he was 13 years old. In his autobiography, Gandhi noted that he left his father's deathbed and went off to have sex with his wife when his father died, and this caused him great guilt. After his wife died, Gandhi decided that he needed to test his strength against his sexual desires. To do so, Gandhi shared a bed with naked teenagers, including his grandniece, Manu Gandhi. Gandhi was already in his 70s at the time, while his grandniece was 18 or 19 years old. The young women, possibly girls, were essentially serving as temptation for Gandhi, testing his celibacy. The goal was for him to not become aroused by them. This is a Hindu practice known as Brahmacharya. Gandhi believed that perhaps the violence of a Hindu-Muslim conflict in Bengal was caused by deficiency in his celibacy, so this test was to see if he was truly strong in his steadfastness. Gandhi even considered wet dreams to be a breaking of his celibacy. Some of those around Gandhi advised him that these tests were not a good idea, but he proceeded anyway. A couple of people even quit their work with Gandhi as a protest to this action. While Gandhi believed in the full equality of women and women's rights, which he showed through his political movements, some of his views and more personal actions illustrate a more complex, misogynistic reality. In terms of birth control, Gandhi believed that women should learn to resist their husbands, and men should try to control their sexual urges. In his view, sex should only happen when trying to procreate, so contraceptives were not the answer to giving women autonomy over their bodies. Contraceptives would only allow people to indulge in sex for lust, which he believed harmful. He also believed in women's education and women joining the workforce, but in addition, he believed that women should be responsible for all domestic activities in the home, including raising children. Some note while this strikes us as very conservative today, this was quite progressive during Gandhi's life. When discussing a woman's honor, Gandhi wrote, I have always held that it is physically impossible to violate a woman against her will. The outrage takes place only when she gives way to fear or does not realize her moral strength. If she cannot meet the assailant's physical might, her purity will give her the strength to die before he succeeds in violating her. He demonstrated this belief when a boy was caught harassing two girls. Gandhi chose to cut the girl's hair off as a way to keep the boy's eyes off them. Gandhi was also always surrounded by female attendants who waited on him, massaged him, and even walked with the assistance of two women who he referred to as his walking sticks. One of them was Manu Gandhi, and the other was Abha, the wife of his grandnephew. Gandhi's work to achieve India's independence from colonial rule is undeniable. In India, he is seen as the father of the nation and treated as almost a saint. There are numerous memorials to him all over the country, and he's honored on the anniversary of his birth. But in more recent years, his other actions and beliefs have come under scrutiny. In 2018, the University of Ghana removed a statue of Gandhi which had only been installed two years prior. Petitions for its removal began almost immediately after its unveiling, with students and lecturers calling the statue to be removed because Gandhi was racist. They stated that African heroes should be honored instead. In 2015, a statue of Gandhi in Johannesburg, South Africa was vandalized with white paint accompanied with calls that racist Gandhi must fall. Gandhi's own grandson and biographer recognized his grandfather's racist views in 2015, stating that he was, at times, ignorant and prejudiced about South African blacks. It should be noted that while he notes that Gandhi was an imperfect person, he does believe that his grandfather's later statements on racial equality show he was far ahead of and more progressive than most of his contemporaries and that his work in South Africa on behalf of Indians created a blueprint for black rights. However, critics like Desai and Vahid say that to credit Gandhi for this is to ignore the resistance from Africans against colonialism, which existed long before Gandhi stepped foot in South Africa. They also note that comparing his early writings to his autobiography and his book, Satyagraha in South Africa, it was clear to them that Gandhi had seemingly rewritten himself, creating a tidier image for himself later in life. Other scholars note that while he may have been racist earlier in life, his actions and beliefs later in life show he became an anti-racist. One historian, Ram Chandragua, believes that Gandhi's uplifting of women in India paved the way for women to take up prominent positions around the country long before places like the United States did. Others note that Gandhi's views on women are still reverberating through the country today. For example, the issue of victim blaming women for their harassments or assaults, though that is not unique to India. So for the final time, it is healthy to be reminded 
that the strongest might weaken and the wisest might err.